Welcome, everybody. My name is Lisa Goodpaster. I'm an Associate Director of Project Management here at Carl Illinois College of Medicine. I also work with our REACH program. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit about Carl Illinois and REACH, and then I'll introduce our speaker today. Um, here at the Carl Illinois College of Medicine, our mission is to educate exceptional physician innovators to deliver high value, compassionate health care through transformative solutions developed at the intersection of engineering, science, and medicine. The Carl Illinois community is driven by four key values that permeate our culture and drive our curriculum in which we refer to as the four C's, compassion, competence, curiosity, and creativity. As part of our culture, the Carl Illinois College of Medicine is committed to creating a diverse and talented community of students, faculty, and staff, which is essential to fulfilling our mission. Carl Illinois actively promotes an inclusive environment in which students, faculty, and staff can learn, teach, research, and serve. This includes supporting and providing opportunities for those that are underrepresented in medicine by having programs such as REACH. The Carl Illinois College of Medicine REACH program, which stands for Research and Education for the Advancement of Compassionate Healthcare, is an intensive clinical and research immersion summer experience for undergraduate students interested in pursuing a career as a physician. In addition to helping students prepare for medical school, REACH was developed to grow the presence of underrepresented minorities in the field of medicine. For more information about the REACH program, please check out the REACH webpage on the Carl Illinois College of Medicine web website. And if you're not already, you can sign up through the interest form to be notified of any new information or opportunities about this program. You can contact us at any time at reach at medicine.illinois.edu. Having said that, I am very pleased um, to introduce our speaker, Dr. Teal. Dr. Teal grew up in Dallas, Texas. After receiving his BA in psychology at Princeton University in 1987, he attended the University of Te Texas Southwestern Medical School, graduating in 1991. Dr. Teal completed his internship and neurosurgical residency at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, Texas, where he finished as chief resident in 1997. He served in the U.S. Army Medical Corps as a major from July 1997 to June 2001. Dr. Teal is board certified by the American Board of Neurological Surgery since November 2000 with a commitment to continuing his education in the latest technologies and procedures available to best treat his patients. Dedicated to providing each patient with the most appropriate neurosurgical interventions for their problems, Dr. Teal takes time to provide his patients with a thorough and honest appraisal of their condition. Together, they are then able to make informed decisions. He treats tumors of the brain and spine, cherry malformations, spinal disc disease of neck and back, and does minimally invasive procedures. Knowing that surgery is not always the answer, Dr. Teal is happy to offer counseling on treatment alternatives and referral options for spinal injections, physical therapy, and watchful or watchful waiting. Dr. Teal is happily married to the love of his life, Yvonne, and has a son and daughter. Dr. Teal's life statement is, everybody is somebody important to the Lord and their family, so let's treat them accordingly. Thank you and welcome, Dr. Teal. Thank you, Lisa. So um, Lisa's gonna be handling my slides for me and I've chosen just as our working topic, um, how to become a neurosurgeon. And so we'll kind of basically unpack some of that. I think some of this stuff, I think is gonna be easy for this audience. Uh, and then we'll kind of finish discussing a book that I think is very helpful to those who are on this journey of trying to uh, become uh, whatever you feel called to be, uh, whether that's a neurosurgeon or uh, a scientist or uh, some other kind of a provider, I think the issues uh, that we encounter uh, are very uh, well summarized by this book, Grit. And so I would highly recommend that you read it, hopefully in your, in your time in the next few months. So as Lisa was saying, I am over at the call brain and spine uh, surgery department. We're part of the Carl Neuroscience Institute, uh, and I've been involved with the Carl Illinois College of Medicine uh, since shortly after its inception. I'm involved in the admissions committee there. Um, so hopefully this will be a chance for us to kind of talk about neurosurgery generally and then some of the other things in particular. Thanks, Lisa. We can go ahead and move to the next slide. 
There we go. So we'll just kind of start with the general discussion and you can feel free to chime in with questions if you have it. Uh, Lisa, how much time do we have? Until um, three, but we can go a few after since we got started a few minutes late. Okay. So we have an hour. Okay. So just by way of introduction, I mean, neurosurgery is the treatment of diseases of the central and peripheral nervous system uh, that require surgery. Uh, so that involves things for the brain, things for the spinal cord, things for the spinal column, uh, and things for the nerves. As we see here on our slide to the right, um, I don't think you can see my cursor, but uh, we have just a model of the cervical spine. And so this is obviously not what it looks like in real life, but this is a good demonstration that you may see in some of your anatomical labs uh, and just some of your review um, processes. And this really just highlights the importance of anatomy for the surgeon. So we do have to become students of the architecture of the spine, students of the architecture of the brain to be able to successfully navigate. We'll go with our next slide. So this is just a look at some of the newer technologies that we deal with. Uh, just by way of orientation, toward the front of this slide is the uh, vertebral column. Uh, toward the back is what we call the spinous processes and the skin. And then there in the middle is the spinal canal. And off to the right side of this slide, you'll see a fairly large disc herniation, which is causing a lot of impact on that nerve, uh, which in this case would be the left side for the patient. And so this patient would generally present with some severe left arm pain, probably some weakness. Again, uh, this, this gets much larger and it could put pressure on the spinal cord. So this is one of the areas of surgery that we may be, inv will be involved in. Next slide. This is just by way of orientation, a head CT. And this introduces another problem that neurosurgeons get to deal with, which is brain trauma. So this slide is uh, a very dramatic appearance of a severely bruised brain on the left side uh, for this patient, but on the right side for us. And so this is going to be a problem for the patient. Uh, and you can see that the, the black structures there represent the ventricular cavities, which should not be on the opposite side of the uh, skull here, but that indicates a significant amount of brain edema. We see some bleeding. So this is gonna be a very complicated and likely a poor outcome for this patient who by mechanism probably had a car wreck or something high velocity. We'll go to our next slide. So some of the things we can discuss in our time together uh, is again, what education is required to prepare for neurosurgery? Uh, what is the salary range for this field? Is there a need for neurosurgeons? Uh, what skills are needed for success in neurosurgery? And then we'll conclude talking about the importance of grit. Uh, and we'll define that as we go here. Uh, the next slide. So uh, just by a way of introduction, again, uh, I tell people to be a neurosurgeon, you've got to go to at least the 22nd grade and probably the 23rd grade now with the year being added on to the residency. So um, you're going to uh, need to deal with uh, college for four years. Um, and obviously there are some programs that are combined. Um, and I'm gonna put the chat over here and I'll get to those questions in just a sec. Um, and again, some people may be involved, involved in a combined program. Um, uh, those programs are a bit more intense. Obviously your timeline is shorter, so you're really trying to get a lot done. Uh, medical school, the traditional is gonna be four years. Uh, with a longer time for those who are doing the MD, PhD. Uh, after uh, medical school, if you are interested in neurosurgery or any kind of surgery, you're gonna need to do an internship. Uh, for the neurosurgery crowd, that's one year in general surgery. For other disciplines, it may be two years. And then your residency training in neurosurgery is now seven years. Um, and given some of the work hour restrictions, uh, the fellowships, which are one to two years of specialized training or research after that residency uh, have gotten more popular. And those have come in various flavors. There's a spinal fellowship, there's a vascular fellowship, there's pediatric fellowships, there's brain tumor fellowships, there's you know, just, uh, just about every discipline that we do in neurosurgery has a fellowship. Um, so one question came in from Anjali about what kind of sutures are used in neurosurgery. 
Uh, we'll come back to that, but generally um, we use Vicryl sutures, we use nylon sutures, we use, we don't use cat gut and some of the old school sutures, but generally it's gonna be a nylon or Vicryl, uh, proline, uh, those kind of materials. Uh, we have some antibiotic impregnated sutures that we like um, to kind of decrease our infection concern. And we've got different sutures that kind of lock to themselves. So there's a lot of variation on the sutures. The next slide. So we talk about the salary range and we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I think there's some variation with this. It really depends on your practice options, whether you're doing academic, private or doing the military. Uh, generally the ranges that are quoted range from 60,000 up to a million plus. Um, and obviously there are various factors in healthcare that are affecting income potentials. Um, and I think a big production is uh, made about uh, not chasing some sort of a monetary process, but really chasing something that you feel passionate about and that you can do. Because the last thing you want is to chase something and then get what I call destination sickness, because you don't like it when you get there or it's not what you thought you wanted to do. So I think in your time looking at medicine and looking at what you're doing, I think you wanna get a sense of what fits your personality style, what fits your, your pace, um, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, but I think it's important to get the exposure that you guys are getting in reach because you want to get as much exposure early on to all the aspects of uh, what's going on there. Um, next slide. I'm on a conference call. Um, so we talked next about the present state of U.S. neurosurgery. Um, the numbers... Um, are approximately 3,700 neurosurgeons in the U.S. with a total population of the U.S. of 331 million, roughly. Um, so depending on what numbers you quote, there's an estimated ratio of one neurosurgeon per 89,000 people in the U.S. Uh, some estimates are as low as 60,000, one per 60,000. Um, in terms of training programs, there's 102 accredited training programs in the U.S., uh, graduating about 1,200, uh, sorry, with about 1,200 total trainees with 160 graduates per year. Um, and so this, uh, the length of the training is seven years at a minimum. Some places will go 10 years, depending on the research component of the residency. So the neurosurgery workforce grows very slowly. Um, and so this is a problem um, that we'll talk about in a minute, but the technical requirements of neurosurgery, the equipment needs, uh, needing a microscope, needing an MRI machine, needing a CAT scan, needing an angio suite, needing some of the high-end equipment that we'll talk about, tends to keep these in areas with larger populations. You're generally not gonna see uh, neurosurgeons in very, very small towns, but they need to be in an area, usually with a catchment of somewhere up to 500,000 people. Um, Shane had a question about computer simulations and their incorporation into neurosurgery and surgical training. Uh, is this something worth, worth pursuing in addition to research and medical training? Um, and I would say, Shane, yes. Um, the, the future belongs to some computer simulations that are being used <clears throat> uh, for surgical planning as well as for training. And um, Carl Illinois has uh, some uh, virtual and computer simulations that they're using here to help train students. Hopefully you'll be able to see that over at the Jump Center um, on calls on the U of I's campus. And also uh, there are some other things that are done for surgical planning where a surgeon can actually look at a patient's films, do a run through of the surgery virtually with the OR team, looking at equipment, looking at positioning, looking at all these variables and spine surgeons can look at the intended surgeries and pick the screws out, pick the rods out, figure out the best trajectories. So there's a lot of uh, information being used in computer technology. Um, next slide. So this again goes to the, some of that question, the future demand for neurosurgery, uh, Shane's question touched on it, but the newer technologies in neurosurgery include computer-assisted surgical navigation, 
and less invasive procedures to improve outcomes and expand, expand the treatment options. Um, and so one thing that uh, neurosurgery is benefiting from, like every other discipline, is the ability to do more with less uh, in terms of less invasive, uh, less tissue destruction. Um, and so in certain situations, that's really transformed the way we treat things like pituitary tumors, brain tumors, uh, lumbar disc, um, and even things like Parkinson's tremors. So um, there's a lot of things that we're doing. So if you're a fan of technology, in addition to your medical training and your research, uh, you're gonna have an opportunity to use all your skills. And I think your generation obviously bring in more gaming and more uh, hand-eye coordination in different arenas is gonna be helpful. Um, um, so more neurosurgeons will be needed Obviously, the aging of the population is driving an increased need for neurosurgery. Uh, when we look at the neurosurgeons who are practicing, about 50% are greater than 55 years old. So that means that we're gonna have some who are toward the end of their careers. Uh, and usually about 20 years out, they're gonna be looking to wind down. And so having more people in the pipeline is gonna be necessary. And one thing that's even talked about in neurosurgery circles now is the need for neurosurgery worldwide. So some universities like Duke have launched programs in Africa. Other groups have gone in and tried to help deliver equipment to upgrade. Because one thing we're finding worldwide is there's a real dearth of surgery, but a high need. And there's a lot of mortality associated with that. So trying to work through that is a big issue. Um, next slide. So we've got a couple of questions that relate to surgery. So we'll go ahead and answer those. When a burr hole surgery is done, and a burr hole is done to drain uh, a hematoma, and uh, generally a burr hole can also be used to access uh, various tumors or things to a biopsy. So generally, it's closed the same way we close any wound. It's usually a multi-layer closure, and we leave the close with sutures or staples, depending on what the situation requires. Uh, another question was, does neurosurgery align with issues of the sciatic nerve? And or is that nerve related to muscular problems? Uh, and that question comes from Sid and that brings up a good question, Sid. One thing we have to be cognizant of as surgeons is what is a surgical problem and what's a medical problem? Uh, there is some overlap in various disciplines. Maybe a patient has a hip problem and is having leg pain from that. Maybe a patient has a knee problem or an ankle problem. Um, but the sciatic nerve classically is the L L5-S1 nerve that comes under pressure from a disc herniation and cause an electric shock feeling down the back of the leg. And that can be associated with weakness. It's generally a very severe pain. So neurosurgeons or spine surgeons treat that. Uh, spine surgery can be done by neurosurgeons. It's also done by orthopedic surgeons. Uh, so there's a, there's a multitude of people treating the spine. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. So we talk about the important skills for neurosurgery. Um, and so these are the ones that I think are fundamental. Um, one of them is persistence. Um, and I think obviously from a neurosurgery standpoint, sometimes the cases can go long. Uh, sometimes you can go eight to 10 hours with a case. So you've got to be able to have that persistence, that ability to kind of keep working around a tumor's margins until you can get it free without damaging the brain. Uh, somebody was asking a question about a blood clot. Um, blood clots can, quote, heal on their own if they're small, but if they're very large, then you can start having troubles with the patient getting weak or the patient getting headaches or getting drowsy. So again, persistence helps you keep an eye on a patient that you're trying to watch so you don't get uh, lax in how you're assessing them and let them get into trouble. Um, so the focus factor is again one in which there's a lot of distractions when you're in the operating room there's a lot of distractions in your day in the hospital so being able to focus being able to keep a mindset of what that patient needs what the treatment plan is that's very very important and then this ability to learn from mistakes you're going to make mistakes you're going to have miscues and what we call therapeutic misadventures um, and some of that is just learning some of that is just the patient doesn't read the textbook. And so you have to be able to rebound. And we'll talk more about that. 
obviously there's a lot of reading in neurosurgery, a lot of reading in medicine. So you have to be a good student of uh, the literature and be able to grasp concepts and work and integrate those concepts. One thing that's really important in modern medicine as we know it is the ability to work as a team leader and a member. You have to be able to be able to go from one role to the other. You have to be able to understand that um, collaboration and community make things go better. So obviously we don't want steep hierarchies where somebody can't speak or can't contribute. And sometimes you can benefit from somebody else's expertise. So you want to be flexible. You really have to have a desire to learn and try new things. If you're somebody who doesn't like change, doesn't like uh, things uh, flowing, then you, you, I would think you need to look at a different discipline. Uh, and that's going to be tough to avoid that in any area of medicine now. We talk about mental toughness, which really is the ability to, again, uh, take criticism well, uh, you know, honestly critique yourself, and, and be able to work that uh, process of growth forward. Physical stamina is an important thing. Uh, in neurosurgery, you're going to stand a lot if you're doing spine surgery. Uh, if you're doing cranial work, you can sit, but even staying focused through the microscope, being able to work three or four hours at a time, that's going to require you to take good care of yourself. So you're going to have to have the ability to guard your health, get your exercise, get your rest. Uh, there will be times where you can't you know, get uh, all the rest you need or desire for a season. Now, we've all tried to avoid prolonged periods without sleep, but if you're on at a busy trauma center and things go into a crisis mode, you may have to really work uh, extended periods of time, 24 hours, without being able to rest. Uh, but hopefully you can get some off time and kind of reboot. Uh, flexibility is an important one uh, because again, you can start out with a simple plan, but then your plan becomes complicated by things that come up. And, um, and then the last thing I would say is compassion. Uh, if you can't be empathetic and sympathetic towards your patients, that's gonna be a problem. And one of the things we're grappling with in every discipline is burnout and compassion fatigue is one of the signs of that. So I think we have to be careful and mindful of that so we don't get ourselves in a problem. Um, there was a question about awake surgeries. Um, awake surgeries are done generally for tumors where we're trying to map the motor strip and the speech areas. Uh, and those are surgeries that are very uh, exciting, obviously, but require a lot of coordination with anesthesia and with our uh, neurology partners who can come in and actually do a neurologic assessment, have the patient read the paper, while the surgery is going on or have the patient in some cases play an instrument or do something and then be able to see when they no longer can do that in real time. And so that goes way back to Wilder Penfield and some of the work he was doing in uh, Canada. Next slide. So this is the concept that I think is very practical and useful uh, for all of us as we're going through any effort to try to do work with excellence. Uh, this is a book written by Angela Duckworth, uh, and it's called Grit, as you can see, the power of passion and perseverance. So I've just gleaned some quotes and insights from this that I'd like to share uh, with the group, and this will kind of bring us to the close of our time together. Uh, next slide. So this concept of grit um, goes by different names. Um, but in, in uh, Dr. Duckworth's assessment, grit is a combination of passion and perseverance that builds off of determination, hard work, resilience, and a sense of direction. Um, and so I think those are things that we all want to uh, cultivate as we're going through uh, this journey uh, in our education and our professional lives. And I love this quote, but that our potential is one thing but what we do with it is quite another. Uh, and I think one thing we find is that there, there are a lot of people who have great potential, but they don't execute because they don't take those necessary steps. And so we see that with our patients, we see that with our peers, we see that in ourselves. So this important concept of grit, and Dr. Duckworth generated a grit scale that she tested at various places. And when the, people took this grit scale, it was more predictive of who would succeed uh, than any other variable that she was looking at. And so when she looked at West Point 
uh, attendees who had to get through the very grueling first year and very grueling test, those who had the higher grit scores would tend to be able to finish compared to those who didn't. And they may have the same GPA, they may have the same uh, college scores, they may have written, you know, had similar experiences, but this extra factor of being able to lean in and not quit and carry on was important at West Point. It was also important when she looked at special forces selection courses, the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets. When you looked at people who had higher grit scores, they had a higher finishing potential. Um, she even looked at the National Spelling Bee and looked at students who did well and went on to be champions there. What did it take for them to accomplish that? And so this is a great book. She talks about swimmers, talks about big time athletes, your Kevin Durant's and people like that. So it's an important concept that I think has application across multiple disciplines. Next slide. Um, so another quote that's very powerful is talent is not all there is to achievement. And we must guard against being seduced by talent as we forget the impact of effort. And so this effort, effortful training is a much more important variable than natural talent. Again, if somebody doesn't put the effort in, doesn't nuance their training, nuance their approach to a problem in a different way, they're not going to arrive at the best uh, level of achievement for them. Uh, and when we think about this quote, the most dazzling human achievements are in fact the aggregate of countless individual elements, each of which is in a sense ordinary. And greatness is in many, many individual feats and each of them is doable. I think the concept is we look at people who've achieved great things or operating at a high level and we think I couldn't do that. Well, the reality is you could do that if you broke that down into the steps that you needed to take to reach that level. And so this isn't something that's so out of reach for people. It's just a matter of making the effort and doing those things that you are able to do and keep doing them better and build on those things. So the, the, the greatness that we see is often the collection of individual efforts and individual potential meeting uh, and resulting in great results. And I think for those who think, well, I'm not as talented as so-and-so, that's not the question. The question is, are you willing to work? And, and use the talent that you have. Next slide. Uh, this is another quote that I found really powerful. Uh, Great things are accomplished by those people whose thinking is active in one direction, who employ everything as material, who always zealously observe their own inner life and that of others, who perceive everywhere models and incentives, who never tire of combining together the means available to them. So there's so much in that, but I think it's important to have a sense of direction. It's important to use everything as fuel, your, your successes and your failures. It's important to have an inner life where you guard your heart, your character, your moral compass, as we say. And then you've got to be flexible to using whatever is at your disposal. Life is not going to set everything up perfect, perfectly for you every time, but you have to be able to use what's there to get maximal benefit uh, and obviously cultivate a skill set where what you need is there when you need it. But I love a couple of equations you put in the book. One is talent times effort equals a skill. The next one is skill times effort equals achievement. And so when we talk about talent, talent requires the investment of effort to become a skill. Whether you're a talented singer, you're not a skillful singer if you don't take the effort to become better. Skill in, requires the investment of effort to result in achievement. Again, we're not going to accomplish anything if we don't put the effort with our skill so we can strategize and get to a place of achievement. So in life, these equations suggest that effort counts twice as it grows skill and it yields a product. So effort is really fundamental to what we're doing. The next level, next slide. So we talk about how one thing that Dr. Duckworth talks about is how grit grows. And I think if you're a parent with children or going to be a parent with children, this is a really important concept for you as you raise your kids and try to steer them, steer them forward. The first thing is interest comes first. So when we're starting out with something, we want to learn to discover, develop, and deepen our interest. 
So if you're a parent with child with a child, you want to expose them to sports and music and activities and if whatever they show an interest in, you really want to help them discover, develop, and deepen that. So obviously as students, you want to develop, you know, discover, develop, and deepen your interest. You've got to have that inner motor that allows you to be able to lean into these next stages. The next stage is practice capacity. If you don't practice it, you won't get good at it. So perseverance becomes a daily discipline to get better in your weak areas and resist complacency because ah, I'm pretty good at this level. And this habit of discipline is an acquired taste. You and I have to work toward this. For most of us, it doesn't come naturally to be disciplined. But the goal is to be use what we call better time on task. Uh, experts don't just do things a lot. They do it better than other people. They, they hone their craft, they refine their technique. So this concept of deliberate practice becomes the way they become the best at what they do. And so when you look at a basketball player, there's Kevin Durant level, and then there's just the guy at the end of the bench on the Lakers. But Kevin Durant has taken his game to a higher level because he's used deliberate practice. He's worked on his jump shot. He's worked on his free throws. He's worked on his crossover. And those things make him an elite player. And we'll see what happens with the NBA as they try to come out of COVID, right? But most people are excited to see him come back because he's a player who's gifted and has used his gifts well. And I love this concept. The goal is to make what we call conscious incompetence become unconscious competence. So most of us, when we start something, we know we're not doing it to the best of our ability. We're not doing it the best it can be done. But if we keep working with it, we can become really unconscious, not having to think about what we're doing anymore. The steps have become natural because we've practiced them enough. And that's what we call unconscious competence. And that's what we want to get to as students, as we want to get there as professionals. So the next stage in this growth of grit is purpose. This is your conviction that deepens what you do and makes what you do matter to you and to other people. This is what we call a sense of purpose and meaning and whatever you do, you want to have a sense of purpose and meaning. The story is told in the book of uh, a guy goes and watch, watches some bricklayers. And he asks, well, what are you doing? One guy says, well, I'm just making bricks. He goes to the second guy, what are you doing? Well, I'm just building a church. He goes to the last person. He says, what are you doing? He says, I'm building the cathedral of God. Needless to say, the last person was doing the work the best, had the most impact, had the most input to why, why this was important. So we want to get the sense of purpose in what we're doing, try to maintain that. And I think that's one of the best things we can do to prevent burnout. Next slide. So when we talk about hope, hope is the, the last thing in this growth of grit. Uh, but this allows perseverance no matter what one encounters. And there's going to be obstacles to you going to med school. It's going to be obstacles to you finishing college obstacles to you staying married, obstacles to you raising your kid, right? So life is gonna give you opportunities to rise to the occasion. Hope is the fuel that lets us do that repeatedly. So for sustained success, this needs to be present in every stage of our grit development, our resilience development, as we call it. So a fundamental skill has to be the ability to keep getting up no matter how, time, no, no matter how many times you're knocked down. And this is, again, a personal thing. I can't give you hope. You have to cultivate the sense of hope in yourself. Obviously, from a faith orientation, we get that from our faith, uh, some of us. But you have to be able to have that hope that holds, the anchor that holds. Uh, the important thing about grit is every aspect of it can be learned and nurtured. So if you start out thinking, well, I'm not that gritty, I'm not that resilient, you can learn it. Working hard and being rewarded can be learned, as can giving up and quitting. So we've got to be really committed to a growth mindset, kind of keep a sense of optimism and keep a sense of perseverance over adversity. Um, so let, next slide. So these next steps kind of coming down, landing the plane. Uh, I think most of you are already involved in these next steps. You're taking the core science classes. You're taking the MCAT. You're striving to get into medical school. I would say if you're interested in neurosurgery, you want to find a neurosurgery mentor at your medical school. Um, so you can have somebody help you start navigating this course. And what you guys are doing this summer, hopefully working in the hospital, working in the labs, those are things that you really want to do. Um, 
I'm going to blow up the chat here a sec. I'll get some of these questions finished off. Um, somebody was asking what made me uh, want to be a neurosurgeon and what allows me to keep going uh, in times of distress or hope and hopelessness. Um, I think for me, uh, obviously I'm a person of faith, so my faith orientation helps me stay grounded knowing that I am connected to a higher purpose. Um, and I think that a book like Grit is a great book because it just makes these things practical in tangible ways that you can practice and kind of grow in these areas and understand that you're not alone in the struggle to keep going uh, no matter what the adversity is. I got drawn to neurosurgery because uh, a personal experience in my family where my grandmother got a neurologic illness, died a pretty swift death behind that, and that got me aware of how vulnerable we are to neurologic insults and injury. Um, and so when I went to med school, uh, neurosurgery or ne uh, neuroanatomy and surgery were two early passions of mine. So neurosurgery was a good fit for that. Um, somebody asked a question about RNS versus VNS for epilepsy patients. Um, how often do we see patients with seizures and are there any promising treatments in the future? Um, I'm not sure what the R RNS is. I know what the vagal nerve stimulator is. Um, I think this other RNS may be another version of a stimulator. Um, but basically, there are different ways to treat patients with seizures. We do have an epilepsy department here. We've got epileptologists in our neurology department. We've got the ability to do um, overnight monitoring, uh, sleep tests, and see if somebody's having seizures in their sleep, or do longer term monitoring and see if somebody's having seizures despite their medications. Uh, for those patients who are having medically refractory seizures, they come down the surgery trail. Uh, the vagal nerve stimulator is a less invasive option to deal with it. We make an incision in the neck on the left side. We put the vagal nerve stimulator around the vagal nerve. We then put a generator just below the clavicle, and that pulses and can turn off uh, that abnormal electrical activity in the brain. Uh, for those who want another option or that's not an option they want, you can have a temporal lobectomy where a part of the brain is isolated on testing and then that part can be removed to take that seizure focus away. Uh, obviously, if somebody has a brain tumor or something along those lines, we'll take that out and that will profoundly help with tumor with seizure control. Um, so that's kind of the discussion on that. I think in terms of future uh, seizure things, there's a lot of stuff with medications uh, there are some uh, different stimulators, cortical stimulators that are trying to come out. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a moving target because seizures can be very debilitating for people. Uh, somebody asked a question about neuro PAs or physician assistants. Uh, they're generally going to go through a four-year college track and then do two, two years as uh, PAs uh, in training. Uh, those are at allied health programs at some of the major universities. Um, and so they're generally looking at a six year run and then they're going to train with their physician for a year or two. Um, somebody asked a question about weekly morbidity and mortality conferences. Um, sometimes they're done weekly, sometimes they're done monthly, uh, but these are kind of after action reviews for surgeons. Uh, and these are very important in terms of helping us deal with trends that we don't like, either patterns of patient injury, uh, patterns of things not going well with surgeries. Uh, and so those are very important. And those are a time honored tradition to look objectively at uh, surgical uh, incidents or surgical outcomes, surgical technique to really refine that and help us get better. Uh, so that's a very, very important process in medicine uh, these days. Uh, somebody asked the question of how much of a brain does a person need to live with? Uh, I think this speaks to the question of hemispherectomies, which going back to the question about seizures and young children, um, neurosurgeons have in some cases taken out half of the brain and done uh, that to disconnect that part of the brain, which is very abnormal from the part of the brain that is functioning better to allow that brain to function. That can be done in young age children. That's not something that can be done in older adults. Uh, generally, as we get older, across that uh, 10 or 12 year old barrier, then that's a problem with taking significant brain because that function doesn't move away from that area as well. 
uh, but doing the hemispherectomy early, uh, the brain uh, can function very well with just uh, that half hemisphere there. Um, typical OR day for me starts at uh, seven, um, and depending on the number of cases, can end at three, five, or seven p.m. depending on the case. Uh, typical clinic day starts at nine and usually will end by five. Um, and then we have call days where we run from sunup one day to sunup the next day, at least on call. And then whatever case comes into the ER, then we'll be fielding that case. Um, for me, my favorite surgical case um, would probably be a, a cervical case. Um, those are nice anterior cervical cases, nice tidy cases. Patients do well, they go home. You tend not to have to deal with some of the more complicated problems of a tumor recurrence or needing chemotherapy or radiation therapy. So some of those simple cases are nice. Uh, obviously you kind of take what comes in, uh, what comes in the door, so to speak. We can go to the next slide. So this is my favorite hook your, hook your brain up to the battery uh, picture. Um, so on uh, the surgery days, um, and somebody asking about work-life balance, uh, I think the work-life balance is very important. Um, and so um, the issues become trying to have uh, associates helps with your life balance, because if you're the only neurosurgeon in town, you're going to get very overtaxed. Uh, so that's part of it, looking for a practice where you can have associates. Uh, the other piece of work-life balance is taking time to exercise, taking time to rest, uh, taking time to eat and take care of yourself, uh, and really tending to the total person. So you're not overgrown in your professional life, but undergrown in your personal life or your spiritual life. Um, and so I think you have to strive for work balance. And it's a dynamic target because as you can get into medicine, you can get very busy and you have to recalibrate. So taking vacation time. Uh, I try to take a week off every 13 weeks or every 12 weeks, just shut it down for a week. Uh, and that's been very helpful and therapeutic for me. Um, there, I just noticed this other question and answer line. Uh, the longest surgery that I've done, I've actually done probably a 24 hour surgery back when I was in residency. Um, those, weren't, those weren't recommended, but you get into a tumor or a certain complex situation and you're there until you get the work done is the answer. Um, I think uh, those who want to do uh, medical public health programs uh, or PhDs, I think, again, you follow your interest. Uh, medicine's a long run, a marathon. So you want to follow your interest and get uh, as much uh, impact as you want in the areas that you feel like you need to cover. Um, technical differences between pediatric neurosurgery and general neurosurgery. Um, Obviously, when we're dealing with the kids, we have to think differently. Um, we have to think about what pathology they have. We have to think about their physiology. Uh, so obviously, you treat them differently in terms of medications, fluids, um, clotting concerns. And uh, again, it's just a different set of pathology you're going to treat in a child as to it compared to an adult. Uh, in the younger babies, the skull hasn't formed yet, so you got to be very careful how you fixate that head for surgery. Um, and so there are some technical things you need to be concerned about. Uh, and generally in medicine, like in neurosurgery, there are so many things that have become so specialized and people are so fine-tuned in their approach to things that um, there are certain things that we can all do. And then there are certain things like intrauterine surgery. I'm not doing intrauterine surgery, right? So if somebody's trying to do an intrauterine BP shunt on a child who's in utero, that's not something that I feel comfortable doing. There are a few centers in the world that are doing that, maybe eight to 10 centers in the US that are doing that. Um, so again, there are certain things that break out in such a high end level that you really triage that over. There are other things that community neurosurgeons feel comfortable treating because we've seen those routinely enough and we know the playbook for those. Um, question of an integrated neurosurgery residency over a general surgery residency followed by a neurosurgery fellowship. Well, generally, uh, this, <laughs> this raises a number of bones of contention. Generally, you're not going to do neurosurgery without having done a neurosurgery residency. Uh, you, can't, you can't do a neurosurgery fellowship unless you've done a neurosurgery residency. So 
the general surgery residency is totally different from the training for a neurosurgery residency. So a general surgery resident is going to be fielding trauma. We all work trauma, but they're dealing with abdominal trauma, uh, you know, lung trauma. Uh, and so it's just a different training path. So if you want to do neurosurgery, you need to get into a neurosurgery residency. Um, for those who want to do neurointerventional, there is a path to do that fellowship through neurology uh, and through radiology. But to do neurosurgery, actually putting scalpels on people, you're going to have to go through a neurosurgery residency to do that. Um, so that's, that's one thing you have to respect that. Um, so there was a question about great topics to start studying now for neurosurgery. Uh, there are a number of great books um, for students. Uh, there is a neurosurgery handbook that the uh, neurosurgery uh, Congress of Neurological Surgeons and American Association of Neurological Surgeons have put out. Uh, there's a handbook of neurosurgery by a fellow named Greenberg, which is kind of the pocket Bible that people turn to. Um, there's all kinds of great resources. Their book, every book you buy now has some sort of an online link, which automatically upgrades and you can load that up to your tablet and take that with you. So there's all kinds of great apps uh, you can download. Um, so there is no dearth of information. The issue now is trying to figure out how to wade through that information and, um, and work through that in a timely fashion. Um, so hopefully that fielded the questions. Uh, we can go to the next slide. I think that's just my question slide. And then the last slide is my, my Princeton Tiger slide. Um, so hopefully we fielded the questions. Um, somebody asked about my email address. Uh, Lisa can pass that on. Um, yes, I can do that. Okay. Um, I'm routinely in email jail, so give me some time if you send me an email. Um, but um, hopefully that covers the field of neurosurgery for you. Any, any other lingering questions? don't see any popping in there. Thank you guys. Those are all great questions. Um, and thank you all for coming to the reach. Uh, and hopefully this has been helpful to you. Uh, you guys are welcome. I was glad to drop in on your day. And hopefully uh, we'll see some of you either at Carl Illinois College of Medicine or we'll see you at some of the neurosurgery meetings in the future. And you can let us know we met in this forum. Thank you, Dr. Teal. And right. so for our attendees, if you have questions um, that you think about later, feel free to email the REACH email and we can either get them to Dr. Teal or connect you with the right people. Thank you very much for attending today.